Amen. You may be seated. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Clap. Wave at somebody. Say hello. Do whatever, because we're going to get started and jump right into today's word. I'm so glad that everyone's here at the crossroads. Are you all excited about today? I was waiting for you too. I was waiting for you too. This is a gift that he's given us, right, to be able to be here. So I'm just thankful for you all, thankful for those online for tuning in, that you took the time. Oh, that's going to be a key word today. That you took the time to come and join us today. Amen? So today we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, we're going to chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Now, the book of Nehemiah is one of the history books. I taught students, this is the way you find it in, in the Old Testament. I said it's after the first and seconds, and it's the ENE. So it's after first and second Samuel, after first and second Kings, after first and second Chronicles, then ENE, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And that's where you'll find it. Amen? So I gave you plenty of time to go look for it, unless you're all waiting for Ethan to get ready to put it up. All right, so here we go with verse 1 through 9. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the walls. Now this is Nehemiah speaking, first-hand conversation, that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so, I, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Verse five, then Sambalus sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent him saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid saying, their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. I want you to pull up Ethan, if you would, verse three again. Verse three, it says, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? What Nehemiah is saying for us today is, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Father, we just thank you for your word, O oh Lord, and I thank you that your people will be able to hear through your word, Father, not through mine, but through your spirit, the things we have time for and the things we don't. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't have time for this. How many of you have ever taken a survey before? You know, we've all taken surveys. And surveys, they're basically done in order to get to, the, to figure out what people think about a particular topic. Well, there was a survey that I had come across where Christians and leaders and pastors and everyone, you know, within the Christian community was asked a particular question. And the question was, what do you hold near and dear to your heart? What do you hold near and dear to your heart? What is the, the thing that you think about that is just your prized possession? Something that you have that you're like, this is top on my list. And the purpose of this survey, though, was to remind people of the gift God gave them. Not man, not your friend, not your spouse, not your kids. What did God give you? So when you think about that question, right, when you think about what's the greatest gift that God's given me, some thoughts immediately come to mind, right? Some thoughts of your children, your spouse, I would hope, right? Your spouse, your 
parents, even your health. The greatest gift that you receive from God could be your health. So those are the things, you know, that you would consider right away. But on this list, that very top thing that rose up for these people, and the one, one of the things that we're going to talk about today was salvation. The salvation, salvation in Jesus Christ. That that was the top gift that if you consider of all the things that God has given you, salvation is the number one thing that he's provided us. I mean, amen. Thank you. One amen. Think about what it covers. It covers your past sins. It covers the sins you're doing now, right? Right? Yeah, because we're all perfect, right? The sins that we're doing now and the sins that we're going to do. It covers it all, and all we had to do was basically confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Confess that he's Lord and Savior, and after doing that, we don't have to be perfect. We didn't have to change immediately. We didn't have to do any of those things. All we had to do was confess that he was Lord and Savior, and now think about what it cost us. What does it cost you? Nothing. What does it cover for you? Everything. It covers everything for you. So as a result, we have to consider that our salvation, the gift that God has given us, is the number one thing, the top priority of gift of our prized possessions that we should consider. Amen? And our salvation is the number one thing that we've received. And it's the greatest gift that he can ever provide us. The greatest gift. Now, when you realize God's given gifts, you have to consider that we are supposed to be good stewards of his gifts, right? We're supposed to be good stewards. We're called, we're given the command to be good stewards of this. And Christian stewardness requires us to maintain, to cherish, to use wisely the gifts that we've been provided. How many of you have ever received a gift? Once again, all hands should go up, right? Consider the gifts you received as a small child. Sorry, Andrew, dad's like, I never gave you anything. <laughs> uh, consider the gifts you received as a child. Consider the gifts you received as an adult. I know when you were a child, you received toys. You received dolls, right, Gabriel? You received um, doll houses. Uh, as an adult, you received, you know, your electronics, your phone, other stuff, computers. And what did you do with this gift? You would spend time with it. You would play with it if it was a toy. You would engage it. You would find out if it's your computer, if it's your cell phone. You did everything that you could to figure it out. You were playing with apps. You were looking at it. You were sharing your gift. You were showing it off to others. And you just dived completely in it because you enjoyed your gift. Nobody twisted your arm. Nobody forced you. Nobody bribed you. You just enjoyed the benefits of your gift. I'm here to tell you today that it's the same with our salvation. It's the same with the gift that God has given you, that we're supposed to dive in it, that we're supposed to enjoy it, that we're supposed to spend time with it, that we're supposed to spend hours and days and weeks and months and years just figuring out what this gift is, enjoying it, not because anyone forced you to come to church, not because anyone forced you to receive the gift, not because anyone bribed you with donuts and coffee to come to church or food afterwards, but because you love the gift. And not only do you love the gift, but you love the giver of the gift. Amen? So we are supposed to be good stewards of that gift. If we value our salvation, we're supposed to spend, you know, time praying, studying, working out our principles of faith, communicating with God because he provided us this gift of salvation. We need to be good stewards of our gift. Hebrews 2 and 3 tells us not to neglect what? The gift of salvation. The gift of salvation. We can't neglect it. When we choose to neglect the gift, what happens to it? We forget about it. It becomes nasty. It becomes useless to us. We're not really dealing with it. If you neglect people, what happens if you neglect someone that you have a relationship with? What happens to that relationship? It becomes kind of stale. We can't neglect our salvation, which is our relationship with God. Amen? We have to keep it. We have to keep that gift. Now, I talked about the very top gift, but let me tell you what was the second top thing that came up on this list of this survey. The second most important thing was time. The gift of time that God provided to us. 
That's why it was awesome, the song. That's why I had to come up. I know Dan's normally like, I got a plan. You're messing up my plan here. You're throwing a wrench in it. But it's a gift of time that we have to acknowledge God. It's a gift of time. And we live in a world where, I mean, we're just all over the place, aren't we? We're over here doing stuff. We're over there doing stuff. I can tell you about my week. We're all over the place, and everything is governed by time. You know, your work, governed by time. Your sleep, governed by time. Your meals, governed by time. Your workout, <laughs> It ain't governed by my time. Your workout, governed by time. All these things are governed by time. Time. We allot so much time for this. We allot so much time for that. We allot so much time for the pastor to preach. You know, God forbid he or her, you know, just like the watch tab, is going over a time. We're like, uh, we can't do this. Come on, I got other things to do. So we allot time or we allot time for certain things. Now, as conscious as we are of time, because there are many of you that are on the schedule. Millie will tell me, boy, you're crazy about you know, how you are with schedules. And I'm like, oh, I got to plan this, I got to plan that, I got to plan that. But as conscious as we can be about time, too often we take that gift for granted. Too often we take it for granted and we're not good stewards of the gift that God's given us. I was just talking about how we need to be good stewards of our salvation. Well, we also need to be good stewards of our time. Think about for a moment how fleeting time is. I mean, when did Facebook start? I don't know, but go back to your Facebook account when you first became, when you first got in, and look at those old pictures of yourself. Or if you don't have Facebook, go ahead, look at the hard copies, and you see how time has flown. Look at your children graduating. Look at your little ones. Uh, my daughter's always posting our grandkids, and I'm like, oh, where did the time go? And that's what we look at. We're like, how fast time has flown by. And a key thing about time, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't have it back. You can't get it back. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be the most brilliant person in the world. You could be the most powerful person in the world. You could be the wealthiest person in the world. You can't create time. You can't create time. All you can do is manage the time that's been created to, for you by the Creator. That's it. That's all you can do. You can't create time. And realize this statement. Realize that the stewardness of your salvation, right? The stewardness of your salvation demands the same thing, the stewardness of your time. In order for me to good, be a good steward of my salvation, I have to be a good steward of my time. Yes? So stewardness, we just said that stewardness was cherishing it, maintaining it, using it wisely. So if I'm going to maintain, use wisely, uh, cherish my salvation, then I need to maintain, use wisely, and cherish the time that supports my salvation. I have to do that with my salvation. And there's no sadder scenario, folks. Here's where we're going to get into the thick things. There's no sadder scenario than for you to attach yourself to something that wastes the gift that God's given you that wastes your time. There's no sadder scenario for you to attach yourself for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, for years to something that is going to waste the God-given gift that's going to be a detriment to the salvation, which is a gift that God has given you. So I pose to you this question this morning. Ready? or oh, not this question, I'm going to pose to you this statement, that there are certain things we engage in, there are thoughts that we entertain, and there are people we encounter that are a waste of our time. Let me say that again. There are things that we entertain. There are, or shall I say, there are things that we engage there are thoughts that we entertain, and there are people that we encounter that we just don't have the time for, that we just can't spend the gift that God's given us on these things. Listen to me. You know how we talk about sharpening, you know, that iron sharpens iron. Well, the word today is here to sharpen you, not to cut you. The word that I'm sharing with you today is not to cut you, but it's to show you that not everything in this world is worthy of the time that we invest in it. No, amen. That's okay. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. 
realize that my statement, though, is not to contradict love your neighbor. It's not to contradict Mark 12, 31 that says love your neighbor. It's not to contradict, I mean, that's our outreach. That's the name of our outreach, to love your neighbor. And here, Pastor Marcel's in the front saying, hey, there are people that are a waste of your time. But what I'm talking about is that I'm not contradicting that statement, but I'm agreeing with Jesus' words. Jesus told us, he gave us multiple warnings that he said that there are certain ones to steer clear from because they're going to lead you astray. They're going to lead you astray. Paul, he warns us in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he says this, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, sound like familiar times? Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And what does he say? And from such people, turn away. From such people, turn away. But I love how he puts it in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 3, verses 15, 14 to 15. I didn't give it to Ethan. In the New Living Translation, it says, Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them. But then he finishes with this. Don't think of them as enemies. Don't think of them as enemies. So I'm not telling you that we're supposed to look at these people as enemies and that we're supposed to fight them and that we're supposed to do these certain things with them. No, what I'm saying is that toxicity that people embrace becomes one of Satan's number one tactics in our lives to get us to pull away from our salvation. Because if someone is toxic towards you, you're not focusing on God. If you're trying to deal with them, and we'll talk about that in a second. If you're constantly trying to do stuff with them or engage them or fight for yourself or put up for yourself, you're not focusing on the things of God. And that's one of Satan's most clever attacks to pull us away from God's glory and God's purpose in our life. And that's one of the primary lessons that comes to us from this chapter in Nehemiah. We're going to go through it. This is what is happening here with Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah... He's a servant of the king from Persia, King Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes has been the ruler, and Nehemiah, he's his cupbearer. He's his cupbearer. I don't know if you understand his job, but let me tell you, it's not a job that you want. Being his cupbearer is someone who every time they bring out wine, he takes a sip of it first. Now you might say, hey, <laughs> I get to enjoy a sip of wine all the time. Yes. No. The purpose behind it was because he was making sure that it wasn't poisonous and it wasn't going to kill the king. As the cupbearer, you had to drink the wine first to make sure, is it fit for human consumption? Was it fit for someone to drink? I mean, can you imagine having that job? I mean, all of us were gathered around one person and everybody's like, bring out the wine. And the wine comes out and you're like, everybody freezes to look at you. And then the party keeps going, yeah, he's still alive. Yep, come on, bring it on, let's get our drink on. Or, and he passes out, and they're like, hmm. all right, get the next cup bearer out here and bring the next vat of wine. That was the job, not a job that any of you would want to be applying for. But as a result of this, he had a great relationship with King Artaxerxes. He found favor in Nehemiah because, I mean, he was willing to risk his life for the king. Now this was a troubling time for Nehemiah though, because although he knew that the temple had been rebuilt, he also knew that the walls around it weren't built. They weren't built up yet, so the city would be uh, susceptible to an enemy's attack or something like that. So Nehemiah in chapter 1, he prays to God and he says, hey, use me, Lord. Use me for the city. And God answered his prayer. He answered his prayer because Artaxerxes says, you know what? Because I found favor in you, he gave him permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. He let him go back, and not only did he send him back, he blessed him so much that he sent him supplies to build up the wall, and then he also provided him with soldiers to help protect them while he did build up the wall. So this was favor that he found. But 
As you continue to read Nehemiah, you realize that from the moment he went back to Jerusalem, he just ran into problems. He ran into problems. He ran into opposition. He ran into so much that, you know, it all came from the three men that we talked about, Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem. From Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, these three guys caused Nehemiah so much trouble, so much opposition, they messed with his intentions, they messed with his uh, efforts to what he was doing, and then they even threatened his life. They even threatened his life, but in the midst of all that opposition, in the midst of all that accusations, or all the accusations, Nehemiah teamed up with people who he surrounded himself that weren't a waste and that were into what God's plan was. He surrounded himself with those people, and in 52 days, they did what wasn't accomplished in 100 years. 52 versus 100 years, they rebuilt the walls. They rebuilt the walls. Now, in chapter 6, Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, they found out what they've done. Hey, the walls are rebuilt, and all he has left is to hang the doors on the gates? So right away, they send word to Nehemiah. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, but five times. Say, hey, Nehemiah, we need to talk. You know, you ever had someone that barged into your office or barged into your classroom or barged into someplace that we need to talk. We need to talk, and we need to talk now. And hey, and then they kind of ease up. You know, let's figure this out. Things don't have to be that way between us. You know, let's just, let's just talk these things out. We don't have to get ugly. Come down off the wall and let's talk. Now, remember, these are the same guys. The same guys that have been continually plotting against Nehemiah, that have made the threats, that have done all these things. So Nehemiah, being a good steward of his time, he says, look, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for that. And being a good steward of his time is the lesson for us today. For us to realize that sometimes Satan has a way of connecting us to situations or even people that try to get us to forfeit the gift of time that God has given us. They try to lure us away from God's purpose. They try to lure us away from God's plan. They try to lure us away from our salvation. And they try to lure us away from the wall that we've been trying to build for God's glory, for the protection of our salvation. This is what I want to preach to you all today. This is what I'm sharing with you all today, that you would understand why Nehemiah doesn't engage Samballot, why he doesn't engage Tobiah, why he doesn't engage Geshem. Come on, realize this, that the reason he doesn't do it is because he says, guys, you're a waste of my time. I don't have time for you. I know what you're up to. I know what you're doing, and I don't have time to pull away from what God has me doing to do the things or to be engaged with the nonsense that you want me involved in. A lot of us get pulled away by certain situations, certain things that would get us doing the useless things for the world instead of the great things for God. Amen, many amens today. That's all right. We're going to keep right on going. We're going to keep right on going. One of the reasons, there are multiple reasons why he does this. And one of the reasons why he stays on that wall and doesn't come down and doesn't give up his gift that he's receiving from God is because he considers who? Who is requesting the time? Who is requesting the gift that God's provided him, which is time? And realize that by this point, he knows that these three men, I mean, they're certified enemies of the things of God. They're certified enemies of the things of God, and they look to do him harm. They're not looking for his best interest. They're not looking to help him navigate and say, hey, you know, we're just trying to counsel you. We're trying to help you so you can be a better person in God. No, they're against the things of God. They're upset that this is happening, and they mean him no good. Throughout the whole book of Nehemiah, if you look at it, if you study it, if you read it, and I encourage you to do so, whenever there's trouble, whenever there's problems, there are three names that pop up, always. Whenever there's trouble for Nehemiah, it's Tobiah. His name will come out from time to time. Yep, it's him. It's Geshem. His name will come up from time to time. But the one, number one name that's always there every single time he has trouble is Sam Ballot. Sam Ballot's name pops up 
every single time. And Nehemiah knows that if there's anyone who can't support him, if there's anyone he knows that's looking out to harm him, if there's anyone he knows that won't believe in the things he's doing for God, if there's anyone he knows that won't encourage him in what he's doing, it's Sam Ballot. Sam Ballot has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's the one that cannot prosper him, that cannot help him, that cannot encourage him, that cannot thrust him forward to the things of God. So I wonder if there are any Sam Ballots in your life today. I wonder if there are any Sam Ballots in your life. I wonder if there are some that are in a relationship, whether it's a professional relationship, whether it's a personal relationship, whether it's an intimate relationship, whether it's not an intimate relationship, whether it's a Christian relationship or not. I wonder if there are any out there who have someone in their life who has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they can't support you, that they can't help you, that they won't speak nice to you, that they won't say a kind word to you, that they won't do anything to thrust you, to keep you in line with the things of God, and all they're doing is to pull you away from what God has called you to do, from what God has called you to be, and from his purposes in your life, and try to rip the salvation of the gift that God's given you. I wonder. I wonder if there's any out there. So then, if there are any that are out there, why would you waste your time on the Sambalots of the world? Why would we waste our time? Why would we waste the gift of our salvation? Why would we waste the gift of our time on the Sambalots? And listen to me. Like I said, I'm not con contradicting Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor. Like I said, I'm following the words of Jesus and following the words of Paul. Steer clear. Steer clear from these people. And what you do is you hand them over to God. You hand them over to God. You say, you know what, God, I'm just going to give them to you. I'm not going to entertain the nonsense. I'm not going to entertain the gossip. I'm not going to entertain the thoughts. I'm not going to entertain these things. I'm going to hand them to you. Realize that in the scripture, it doesn't say that Nehemiah tried to win them over. Nehemiah, he didn't try to win them over. He didn't try to win them over. And what he's teaching us is that we don't have time to win the approval of everybody who's not going to like us. You don't have time. This isn't a popularity contest. Our Christianity is not a popularity contest. For those of you in school, it's not a popularity contest. For those of you at work, it's not a popularity contest. And for those of us everywhere, our life is not a popularity contest. We have to move out of the high school mentality where we're trying to be the most popular kid in school where we're trying to get the most likes, we're trying to get people to like us, or on social media, we're trying to get the most likes, the most friends, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Snapchat, on, 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 on. I don't know them all. I'm too old to figure them all out. But we're, we have to get out of that men mentality like, do they like the clothes that I'm wearing, Dan? Did, did I dress up right? Do I have the proper tie on? I don't have a tie. Do I have the right stuff? Do I have the right shoes? We have to move away from that, and we need to acknowledge that unfortunately, unfortunately, it doesn't matter how sweet you are. It doesn't matter how kind you are. It doesn't matter how gracious you are. It doesn't matter how giving you are. There will be some people who just won't like what you're doing, who just won't like you, who just won't like the spirit of the Lord within you, and you can't do anything about it but to hand them over to God. Amen. Hand them over to God and say, Lord, you deal with them. Lord, there I place them in your hands. Lord, I pray that you would just renew their heart or do whatever. I'm not going to continue to deal with them. I'm going to continue to do my work for you. <laughs> Nehemiah said, I'm going to stay on the wall. I don't have time for that. I'm staying on the wall. So not only does Nehemiah look at the who, but then he looks at the why. Why do they want to talk? Why do they want to talk? And when you read the letter that Sembala sent him, it says, Geshem told me. Oh, boy. Somebody told me that somebody told me that somebody told me. You know where I'm going with there. Geshem told me that you're planning a rebellion, and we need to talk about the rumor I'm hearing. The problem with that, as we already discussed, is that the king had blessed him. It was the king who sent him. It was the king that said, hey, I commission you. It was the king that provided him the supplies. It was the king that provided him with the people. It was the king that provided him with soldiers. So basically, Nehemiah responds in verse 8 with something, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, your rebellion rumor, it doesn't match my reality. 
Your rebellion rumor, this rumor that you're giving me, it does not match my reality. You have grabbed on to this rumor. You've grabbed on to this lie. You've grabbed on to this thing that's not true. And you've convinced yourself of a rumor and made it a reality. But it's not my reality because it doesn't coincide with my truth. So I don't have time to reconcile my truth with your rumors. As Christians, we don't have time to reconcile the truth of God in your life with somebody else's rumors. We're just wasting our God-given gift when we do that. We need to turn it over to Christ. As mature Christians, we don't have time to address what others heard. You know, we don't have, chi- we don't have time to address what somebody told somebody, what somebody told somebody, what you told this person. You ever played the game phone or whatever it's called, where you say something and it passes on by the time it gets there? It's totally different. We don't have time to figure out where was the breakthrough. Where was the disconnect? Who said what? We don't have time for that because that pulls us away from the things that we need to do for God because we're trying to take care of something ourselves. And we just don't have time for that. We need to stay on the wall. We need to stay on the wall. It doesn't matter how much you try to reconcile a rumor. People are always going to think that you're lying. There will be someone that will say you're lying. It doesn't matter if I come to you and I say, look, that, you know, there might be somebody, listen, he's lying. He's lying. And it was the same with Jesus. Jesus, when he was around, only spoke truth. But yet he was always confronted about rumors. And he was always confronted. But what did he do? He kept his peace. He kept his peace. So my encouragement to you today is when the enemy comes with rumors and tries to strip you of your joy, tries to strip you of your purpose of, with God, tries to strip you of your God-given gift of time with rumors and accusations, keep your peace like Jesus did. Keep your peace and don't surrender your gift to engage in those things. Don't allow yourself to get put into a position where you're no longer doing the things of God and representing him because you're trying to defend yourself. Keep your peace. So now Nehemiah, he looks at the who. He looks at the why. And now he looks at the how. The how. He says, well, how did they approach me? And as you read, you figure out that Sam Ballot never went to Nehemiah directly. He never went to him directly. What did he do? He sent word through somebody else also. And I don't know about you, but Matthew 18, 15 tells me that I have a, if I have an ought against my brother, I'm supposed to go to my brother. I am supposed to go to my brother. Not send Sean to my brother. Not send, you know, Paul to my brother. Not send Andrew to my brother. I am supposed to go to my brother in private so that we can talk and figure it out. So that we can figure this out. There are too many people out there that can say <laughs> things to others about a person. They can post stuff on social media about another person, but they can't talk to that person themselves. Folks, we have to stop doing that. At social media, oh Lord, come on now, let's keep going. Social media to me has become such a platform for people to hide behind, to be able to post stuff and not talk to the person directly. All right, let's go back. All right. What I'm trying to do, folks, is to make you sharper by giving you the truth. When Sam Bally, he sends the letter, he also mentions something else. You ready? It mentions in the scripture that it's an open letter. It's an open letter. Do you understand what that means? The open letter is something, basically, it's saying that something that should have been handled in private was made available to everybody else who didn't have a business knowing about it. Social media. Posts by people are basically putting it out there to involve everybody else regarding an issue that nobody had business being a part of because you didn't do as Matthew 18 and go straight to the person and talk about it to them. We need to stop doing that because we're forfeiting our time. We're wasting our time doing other things that aren't of God, where God isn't in it, doing something else. Doing something else. We have no reason being involved in those things. And then on top of that, The letter contains a threat. It contains a threat. It's basically threatening him. And so he's saying, hey, if you don't talk to me, I'm going to go talk to the king. So what he's saying is, the only way I can get to you, the only way I can get to you is by threatening you. 
is by threatening you. And all of these are signs of a situation of people who you don't need to surrender your time to. We don't need to fall for threats. We don't need to fall for any of the enemy's tactics. We don't need to surrender our time. And we don't need to surrender our salvation. Within our salvation, we have peace. We're surrendering it when we engage in these things. When we just let our minds be occupied by these things over and over again. Satan, he's going to try to bring you down from a place in God to deal with these situations, to waste your time, to get you to come down off the wall. In other words, to get you to come down from the things that God has you doing in your life as a worship leader, as a ministry assistant, as a, uh, you know, anyone who's in charge of a ministry. The enemy's trying to get you to pull you away from it, to deal with these other issues, basically by coming after your pride. That's what he's doing. He's coming after your pride. Because your pride wants to defend you. Your pride wants to stand up and say, you know what? You're not going to talk to me like that. Your pride wants to step in and say, you're not going to talk about me like that. Your pride wants to step in and say, look, I need to fix this. I don't want you to think bad of me. Your pride is going to step up and do all these things. And what you have to do is lay down your pride. You got to lay down your pride and allow God to take over in the situation. Allow God to move in. Stay on the wall. Stay on your calling. Stay on the purpose. Stay on the path. Stay on the journey. Stay on the journey and let God do what God does. God says, you know, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God, if God be for you, who can stand against you? So why would you allow pride to handle something instead of God? Come on. Let God do what God wants to do and you just surrender it to God. Stop surrendering it to the enemy. Surrender it to God. All right? So, he says it's a waste of time because of the who. He says it's a waste of time because of the why. He says it's a waste of time because of the how. And finally, he says it's a waste of time because of the what. The what. What does he want from him? Sam Bally, he sends him this message. Hey, let's talk. But notice the meeting place. Notice the meeting place. The plains of oh no. And Nehemiah says, oh no. <laughs> oh no. We're not going there. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. You know why? Oh no, it's 20 miles outside the gates of Jerusalem. 20 miles in the plains. 20 miles away. So he's thinking to himself, he's thinking to himself, um, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You don't want to meet in my office here? You don't want to meet, you know, right here at the gates where I'm working at? You want to have me walk 20 miles outside, you know, I, I, 20 folks, 20 miles, is 20 miles to our house? It takes us 30 minutes to get, it. it's like walking from here to Surrey, oh yeah, good luck, 20 miles, there, there are no cars, there's only camel Ubers, and you can't catch those, there, there are not enough of them, you know, that's all that's available to him, and he realizes, he understands the intention, he knows that basically what Sam Ballard is trying to do is he's trying to pull him as far away from his assignment of God as he can. He's trying to pull him away from his assignment of God, in God. He's trying to pull him away from his salvation. He's trying to pull him away from his peace. He's trying to pull him away from his joy. He's trying to pull him away from all these things into a place where he could try to destroy that assignment and possibly destroy him in the process as well. So Nehemiah, he says, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. He has two decisions he has to make at that point. He, he either stays on the wall and he continues to do the work of the Lord or he allows himself to become distracted. He allows himself to leave that assignment to go do something else, to be involved in something else that God's not even in. God's not in the nonsense, folks. He's, he's like, That's, he doesn't have time for that. He doesn't have time for that and he didn't give you your gift so that you can waste it on that as well. He doesn't have time. Let me sum it up like this. Every day, Satan is going to bring a demonic distraction in your life. Every day, he's going to bring a demonic distraction that the only intent is to pull you away from what God called you to do and from what God called you to be. Every day, he's going to do that. And Nehemiah, he didn't entertain that agenda. He didn't allow himself to give up and forfeit the time for that. And something else that's important. He didn't tell Sam Ballard, hey, come on over. All right, we can do this. Come on over, and we'll talk while I continue to work. We'll talk while I continue to work on the things of God. 
You can't do both. You can't entertain nonsense and work on the things of God at the same time. You can't multitask the priorities of God in your life. You know, many say, hey, I can multitask. I'm a great multitasker. I could do all of this. You know, I could do that. I could do this. I could handle that. I'm a great juggler. I could handle the law. Okay, there's a time and a place for those things. But when it comes to God's priorities, you cannot multitask. Listen to me. Let me say that again. You can't multitask the priorities of God in your life. You can't do it. If you're in a worship service, ready? If you're in a worship service and you're reading your emails or reading your tests, Text, you may think you're multitasking, but you're not worshiping. You may be multitasking something else, but you're not worshiping God. All right, don't put your phones away now. <laughs> if you're reading the Bible, right, and you're watching TV, you're not studying the Word of God. Oh, boy, let's keep going. Let's find one more. If you're praying, come on, listen to me now. If you're praying and you're surfing online, you're sacrificing your time, you're sacrificing your attention, you're sacrificing your God-given gift from God to be engaged in other things instead of speaking to the Creator Himself. You are not multitasking. So what I'm sharing with you is that the way we spend our time is a reflection of our priorities. The way we spend our time is a reflection of our priorities and while I'm talking about, let me go there, while I'm talking about our devotional life, I also want you to consider it with your family life, all right? To the, to, the, to the mothers and fathers here, if you're at an event for your child, hmm. to the sons and daughters here, if you're at an event or you're at dinner with your parents, to the husbands and wives here, if you're on a date night or you're on a night together, but yet in all those three you know, scenarios, you're on your phone the whole time, you just squandered your time. You just wasted time that you'll never be able to get back. Quality time with your family that you just surrendered to something that was useless that won't profit you for the kingdom of God and for the glory of your family that he has gifted you with. You cannot allow it. Share your God-given gift with them and share your God-given gift back to the one who gave it to you which is God. I promise you, I promise you, stay on that wall. It won't be a waste of your time. Amen? Please stand to your feet. One of the biggest challenges we have, which is what Nehemiah, he committed himself to, is understanding the priorities of God in your life and making a decision that there are some things you will essentially have to say no to. There are some things you'll essentially have to say no to so that you can give your all to what God has called you to. Things you say no to, to the things that God has called you to. You have to do it. Realize, I have a question for you. What do you have time for? What do you, after all of that that I said, I went on, you know, I'm over. Oh boy, it's telling me I'm over three minutes. After all that I shared, really think about as we get ready to pray here, what do you have time for? And then when you think about it, realize what's really worthy of sharing the gift that God's given you? What's really worthy of it? And then realize that some things are just not worthy of your time. Stay on the wall, folks. Stay on the wall. May God strengthen you to stay on the wall. May God strengthen you to keep going on the path that he has you on. May God strengthen you and keep you from being distracted by the things that would toss you to and fro, look to distract you, look to rip you away, look to steal from you all that God's given you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. So, Father, we just thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you because as we started out that this is a day that you've made. This is a day that we're supposed to rejoice and be glad in it by us just, Father, giving you back the feedback of how happy we are to receive a gift that you've provided us, O oh Lord. So, Father, may we be good stewards of the gift that you've given us. May we be good stewards of the salvation that we received as a result of your Son. Father, that we may be good stewards of the time 
that you provide us, O oh Lord, and that you would help us to turn away from those things that hinder us, Father God, those things that would distract us, those things that would pull us away to be engaged with the foolishness of this world, Father God, instead of the glory of your presence, O oh Lord. So, Father, help us. Holy Spirit, help us with discernment. Help us with conviction to be able to, to know and make good decisions regarding your purpose and your plans for our life, O oh Lord. Help us to stay on a path that you've assigned for us, O oh Lord, and help us to look at your priorities and make them supersede anything else that the enemy would try to deliver at our feet, such as rumors, accusations, nonsense, distractions, work, relationships, or other things, Father God, that are not beneficial for your glory, O oh Lord. So, Father, strengthen us this day. May we be girded up. May we have our full armor of, of God upon us, Father, where our hearts are protected, where our minds are protected, where our faith is strengthened. Father, where we're engaged in, in your word, where we know what, you've, what you're saying to us, that we would take it and we would dive right in because it's a gift that we love, and we love the giver of the gift, which is you, Father God. We give you all the glory and honor, Father God, as you keep us in perfect peace as we continue your journey. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Folks, stay encouraged. Stay encouraged. Stay on the path. Stay on the wall. Soon, uh, next month, September, we'll give you the exact dates in the next coming weeks. We're going to have our small groups start up. We have small groups that will be taking place in Hampton. I believe we'll be doing one here, and we're still working on one on the south side. But get connected. Get connected, because getting connected to those groups is what keeps you away from the nonsense. This is time that you need to make for these things and not time for those other things. Amen? God bless you all. I look forward to seeing you all here next week at the Crossroads.